Welcome to the Steady On Podcast, where God's hard truth meets your hard story. I don't need to tell you that life gets hard. Life gets hard, really hard. But God's faithfulness is still active and alive in our hard. And these episodes are dedicated to remembering and claiming the promises of a faithful God. I'm your host, Angie Bauman. I'm a pastor and Bible teacher, founder of Steady On Ministries, and creator of the Step-by-Step Bible Study Method. But more than that, I'm a trauma and abuse survivor who carried a heavy weight of shame and worthlessness for many years, and I still struggle, but I live in much more freedom now because I know God through His Word and speak truth to the lies of the enemy with His Word. And that's what we do here. On Mondays, we take it in by studying the promises of God, And on Wednesdays, we live it out with teaching and testimony on the promises of God. So thank you for tuning in, my friend. You are the reason for this show, and I'm so very, very glad you are here. Let's get started. Hi, friend. Welcome in today for a conversation that I rank as an A+. My guest today is speaker, author, and a featured Bible teacher on Right Now Media. Her name is Lori Polich Short, and I absolutely loved talking with her. You are going to love her too. I just know it. Lori's going to tell you a story of disappointment and dreams that for a long, long time didn't come true. But as you hear her open up about the not this ways of her life, I encourage you to listen for the confidence in which she testifies to the yes, but this way messages she continued to hear from God. Waiting isn't easy. Finding contentment where we are instead of longing for and romanticizing where we're not isn't easy, but Lori helps us dive deep into the stories in scripture to connect with the middle parts, the waiting parts of the people in the Bible to help us remember that God sees us and is very much at work in our waiting. Our verse this week is Lamentations 3.26. In the NIV, it says, It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. No one escapes seasons of doubt, confusion, wrestling, and disappointment. As trite as it can sound, it's simply part of living in a fallen world. But, and this is a big but, as followers of Jesus Christ, we can actually lean into those seasons and experience God anew as He reveals His faithfulness in ways we never expected. I think that's what you'll consider about your own life as you listen to Lori share her story. Let's listen in. Lori, we're so glad you're here. Welcome to the Steady On community. Thank you so much, Angie. It's great to be here. Start us off with a little bit of the backstory because I think uh, it's always interesting when somebody writes on a topic like this, you're writing on waiting. And so my guess is you know something about <laughs> waiting on God's timing, God's mysterious timing. So what ha- what's happened in your own life that kind of um, took you to a deeper place of faith and understanding about God's timing? Well, it's interesting you asked me what happened. It's more what didn't happen, <laughs> which I think is so often the case when you are waiting. But for me, it was a long a story of singleness. And I always wanted to be married. And I wasn't the ring by spring gal, but I thought, you know, my mid twenties would be nice. And then 30 came. And then when 40 came, you know, you, you start becoming a professional bridesmaid and, and then you're a professional shower goer and, you know, feeling like everyone, I think we feel like everyone around us has what we're waiting for or wanting. And So when I got engaged at 42, you can imagine the joy in my household. We had our bridal showers so fast and I got my wedding dress and just a couple of months short of my wedding, my fiance got deployed. He was a Marine Corps reservist. And in the course of his deployment, he had an ex-wife that had left him and uh, she began to have second thoughts and they were writing each other unbeknownst to me. So when he came home after nine months, we broke up and now I'm 43 and he remarried his ex-wife. So there were a number of ways why this was hard for me because it was really a God story. When two people can find their way back to each other, especially when there are children involved, that is the best. But to play that role in this situation almost felt like God was being mean to me, to be honest, because here I am 43 and, you know, there were well-meaning people who said, well, isn't it great that God used you to bring them back together? And it, it was the part I played really. Um, But it was a, a, a time in my life where I was speaking and talking about the Lord And my own life was falling apart. And I just remember going to God and saying, 
you know, if I tell my story, people are going to walk away from you. And I really felt him say, don't worry about me. You tell your story. And I always say to people that they're in the middle of my story, which is where I developed the middle of the story theology, because I think if you got up this morning and you're still breathing, God's not through with your story. And it was true for me, but it felt like it because it felt like it was already late in the game. And, but I chose to tell my story when I had the opportunity, when I was speaking. And I think my testimony was so encouraging because I didn't have the happy ending, but I was choosing to hold on to God, the God of the long story. And I didn't know if he still had marriage for me, but I knew that the story wasn't over. It just felt like, wow, this is so devastating. This isn't ever where it ends. And especially when we keep on living and God did have a second chapter for me, but I think that got me started on this whole issue of God's timing, because I think that's where people give up on their faith when God is taking too long to do the thing they want him to do. And they either don't know if he cares anymore, or even worse, if he even exists because the timing is so very different from us. But I I know looking back now that I'm a little bit older and I am able to see so much of what God was doing and is doing in our lives that he can be trusted. But there are times where you feel like you're in the dark and you don't see him and you don't know what he's doing. So that's really where this book came from. You know, I just want to affirm two things. Thank you so much for sharing that. I I love that you're able to confidently say, I choose to trust the Lord, even when it's not going the way I wanted. But there's something also about you, Lori, that's so um, that, uh, attractive, but I mean, like, but um, to to me as a, belie- as a fellow believer, where you're willing to say, not only that, but I will share this story, because if I don't share the story, then you don't really understand how I've chosen to continue to trust the Lord, you know, and it would so- be so easy to back away from that. And so I just want to thank you because... Yes, I think sometimes we minimize how our own life experiences can really help other people, especially when we continue to use those life experiences to point to him, not us, right? Like this is where I found myself and God did this, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I do think, you know, we we do tend to wait until the bow <laughs> is tied and the rings on the finger and the yep. baby comes and all the things that we've been praying for to tell our testimonies. And I really believe we need more middle of the story testimonies because so many people live in the middle of the story and they need that encouragement to hold on. Yeah, for sure. Let me ask about the response. So when you began to tell this story, you said that you were afraid or that you said to God, I'm afraid that people will like, not like you, you know, when I kind of say that, but I, I am certain that's not some of the response you get. What was the response from? Well, you know, initially it was, I I developed ways to tell my story humorously um, (laughs) because there's always humor in everything. Um, But I, I would, I got to the end. And honestly, I remember the first time looking out at the audience and they were just their mouths were open, you know, because it wasn't this happy story. And I said, and I really believe it was the Holy Spirit. I said, but you know, God's not through with my story. And I don't know what he's going to do. And I don't know what will happen and whether marriage will happen. But I know that he's not through because he is the God of the long story. And that really became my theology that I think shaped this book because we see this again and again and again in scripture of God working this different way and this different timing than people expected or wanted. And and so what I try to do is lift some insights that we can Mm -hmm. get from these people that have gone before us. And yeah. I think we need that. In I our do lives. too. I, I love that part of studying scripture because it's so easy to read the story. Here's what, oh yeah, that was hard, but then, and I'm like, yeah, but in those verses in between how much time passed and what was happening and what were that, you know, that's hard. It's easy for us to be like, yes, they had faith because we know how the story ended, but right. But, but in that part that you're talking about, it's like, that's the part that's so easy to get discouraged and to walk away and to get bitter and to doubt and all of those things. And so help us know, what are some of the insights that you talk about in this book about God's timing that can help us hold on to our faith and hold on to the truth of God's faithfulness? 
Well, what I do is I lift different things. You're exactly right, by the way. I think on Sunday morning, we tend to focus on the heroic aspects of the stories, which causes these people to be superhuman. And we think we know their story. But one of the things I delight in is looking for those places in scripture where we see them going through exactly what we go through. So for instance, uh, I begin the book with Job, who really spends his entire book screaming and yelling out to the sky, which tells me that it's okay to call out when things are unfair, because we as readers know what what's going on from the first chapter, but Job never does. And he's not suffering because of anything he did wrong. And God gives him that freedom. And then what's so interesting about that story is he doesn't God never tells Job why he suffered. And so often, so many of us suffer and we don't know why, but what God does is give Job a world tour at the end, a world tour of creation basically says, look at this, look at this, look at this. And Job's lifting of his eyes off of his own story to see that he is part of something so much bigger than he can see and that he has really no idea what his life and his story is going to mean in the bigger story. And of course, here we are talking about him all these years later. So, you know, there's just story after story. I think about Moses, you know, we always hear about Moses and the burning bush and, uh, but he was 80 years old when he had that encounter and he was 40 when he left Egypt. So 40 years of wandering around the, the wilderness as a shepherd that nobody cared about or knew about. Yes. But what I do is talk about the things that happened to Moses during that time that he didn't even know were going on. God was preparing him by teaching him the secrets of the wilderness when he was alone, because soon he'd be shepherding people through that mm-hmm. same wilderness, but he didn't know that. And then his relationship with Jethro, who became his father-in-law, who later became the person that helped him develop his skills and leadership And all of these things were happening during that time, but I'm sure Moses had no idea. And there's, again, so many stories. Joseph, who, you know, he has this dream and then about everything else that could go wrong happens in Joseph's life between the time he has the dream and the time the dream comes true. And I can relate to that so much. Mm -hmm. And I think what we learn from Joseph's story, because he goes from slavery to unfair imprisonment, and then he's there for two years And then, of course, he gets out just at the right time to help all these people, and he's able to look back on his story, but we could have never guessed what was going to happen next in Joseph's story. And I think that's a huge encouragement for people who are in a dark season going, well, this is the way it's always going to be. You don't know that. You may be being positioned for something that's going to happen next, and what you're learning now is going to be part of what unfolds in your story. I, I love all of those stories. I think about David too, like on, on the run from Saul and like, th- there had to been times when he was like, I was anointed for something better than yeah. this. Right. And I'm hiding out in caves with this like yes. ragtag group of people and all those stories that you mentioned. And I think for me, immediately I go to those feelings of being set aside or those feelings of being insignificant or those feelings of being a failure. And because this happened now, this is my story. And if this hadn't happened, then, you know, and I, I love the hope that you just infuse in all of those, because I think it brings hope in all of our waitings to say, um, this doesn't mean that you're set aside now, actually you're God is doing something very active in you. And it certainly doesn't mean you're set aside forever. And it doesn't mean even if something did go wrong or something does feel like a failure, that's not the end of the story. Right. And so, I mean, exactly. Look at Paul. Paul spent so much of his ministry in prison, and I can't imagine that he didn't think to himself, if only I could be spending less time in prison, I could be so much more effective for the gospel. And then he says in Philippians, you know, he tries to look for the the good in it. He says, well, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what's happened to me here in prison, you know, has served to advance the gospel because he was thinking, well, other people are speaking on his behalf, but he looked around in a situation he didn't want to be in and said, what can I do? I can write letters. And little did he know that the letters he wrote from a place he didn't want to be were going to become the greatest part of his ministry because they fill half the New Testament. And he had no idea how many people he was going to be reaching. And so that's where I go, you know, sometimes we, we interpret 
our situation and our circumstances very differently from what they are actually doing yes. in the world and in the bigger story that God has. Yes. Yes. I love what do you think it means to wait? Well, you know, even as like, we're talking about some of these people, um, we see, I I'm so grateful in scripture. We see moments where they wait well, I think, and moments where they don't wait well. What do you think as we are walking through some hard things or waiting on God's timing or trusting him in the hard? Um, what does it mean to wait well? Well, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, you know, we we think of Abraham as the person of great faith. And he did. Every time God came to him, even in the impossibility, Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. But in Genesis 17, this, of course, is the part I talk about. Abraham doesn't have faith anymore that this is going to happen. In fact, it's literally in scripture when God says, no, Ishmael's not going to be the promised son. The son is still to come. He falls down on the ground laughing and says, a, a child is going to be born to a man who's 100 and a woman who's 90. And God doesn't get mad. And I mm. think there's something in that, that God is okay when we're burned out. Mm. He can handle it. And in fact, God joins Abraham in his laughter and says, you know what? You're right. This is so funny. Let's name your child laughter because that's what Isaac means. And I love that God took this elderly couple because there was humor in that. When you imagine a 90 year old and a, and a hundred year old, you know, in depends and diapers at the same time. I mean, that is funny. And yet that was the miracle yeah. that God was waiting for. So I guess another aspect of waiting well is imagining and knowing, and you don't have to imagine because it's true. The longer you wait and the weirder your story is, the more of a God story it will be. Yeah. Because I will tell you, Angie, I wouldn't even be telling my story of marriage if I had gotten married at the normal time and all the normal things had happened. But it's the weird and hard and difficult aspects of our story that God uses most powerfully in his story. Yeah. I I think there's a there's this part of God that just it, it makes us wait almost to like this breaking point so that we have no doubt we didn't do it ourselves. You know, we have to get to that point where we're like, this is ridiculous. Like I'm yeah. just going to stop trying or I'm just going to stop whatever. And then I think he's a little bit like, good. Now I have you where I want you. Right. Yeah. Like when you're just yeah. like, I can't do anymore. I can't make this happen. I can't this or that. I can't. And he's like, I know, I know, but I really right. want to show you what I'm doing in you, not what I'm calling you to do for you. Right. Exactly. Right. And I think we need to open our hands for the way that God answers our prayers. Cause so often we're so focused on the exact way and the exact timing that we want God to work. And if he doesn't work in that way and timing, he didn't answer our prayer. Yeah. Well, he may have something bigger in mind that he wants to do. He may be very well answering that prayer, but in a different way. And I always say, you know, sometimes when you're so focused on the door, you want to see open, watch out for the doors that are opening. Because after my broken engagement, I was devastated in my apartment. And about four months later, I got this random call. I put that in quotations from uh, a friend of mine who was had planted a church in Santa Barbara. And he said, we were praying about this new position and your name came up. And honestly, Angie, I was not looking for a job, but the timing was so weird. And I ended up going to Santa Barbara, which is the place that everyone said, there's no single people there. <laughs> and I, I went to serve this church and lo and behold, that was where my whole future was. And I mean, I really relate to Ruth in that way, because I think she was told the same thing when she followed her mother-in-law and her whole destiny was waiting for her. So be have your eyes open while you're waiting to what God is doing, yes. not just what he's not doing. Yes. That is really important in the wait. Yeah. And, and the more we look for it, the more we'll see it. I think, you know, when you just, yeah, when you decide I am going to find reasons to praise God today and you make this deliberate effort in your life and journal them or write them in your phone or whatever, then I think we just start seeing him more everywhere. And somehow it's like a balm on the waiting, right? Because he is Absolutely. doing this and he is doing this. And I don't know why he's not doing this, but I trust him because I see him in other places, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It just builds that trust muscle, I think. 
And the remembering aspect is really important. Uh, there's a whole chapter in my book on that. Looking back, I mean, how many times does God say, remember, remember, remember? Because mm -hmm. we're such forgetful people. Yes. I think that's why we go to church is to remember that God is at work. If you're not seeing him at work in your life, sometimes you have to look in community and watch what God is doing around you. And then you begin to see him more and more when you're, again, not looking for him to do the thing mm -hmm. that you want him to do at a specific time you want him to do it. Yeah. He's always working. Yeah. We just have to open our eyes to see. I think that's one of the reasons it's so important to tell our stories because sometimes we, maybe we can't believe God's faithfulness in our story, but we can believe it in yours today, you know, or we can believe yes. it in hers today. And we're like, okay, I do see that he works in stories. And so that gives me more hope that he's working in mine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so important. What's the difference between acting in faith and forcing our way to make something happen? Like, how do we do one without the other? Because there is a time to wait and there is a time to move. And how yeah. have you learned to kind of understand the difference? Yes. Well, you know, a, a verse in scripture that was very significant to me when I was going through my crisis of faith and my disappointment was Isaiah 50, 10. Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on your God. And I, you know, like we do with our verses, I had put that verse down so many times. I had never looked at the next verse. And the next verse says, but woe to you who light your own fires and mm -hmm. provide your own torches. This is what you will receive. You will lie down in torment. And I always say, that's not exactly the, the, the verse that you post on social media, but it gives us such wisdom yeah. about the wait that this idea of saying, I'm done waiting instead of God has brought the answer, it's I'm done waiting. I don't want to wait anymore. And we kind of know when we are forcing our way. And there are examples of that in scripture. I think Jacob was somebody who fought, who struggled with that his yeah. whole life of making things happen instead of letting things happen. And then of course, the great wrestling match where he wrestles the angel and gets a new name. Um, but he walks away with a limp and more dependence on God. And I think that that's where God is trying to get us. You know, I, I saw this painting in Paris and it was such a great illustration of this for me. Cause I tend to be a control person. You know, I always like to help God yeah. do the things that I want to see happen, but it was in a, a church called St. Sulpice. And it was, uh, uh, by Eugene Delacroix, it was Jacob wrestling the angel and this huge angel had his hand on his shoulder and the other hand in his hand in Jacob's hand. And Jacob had his head buried in his chest, but it literally looked like he was trying to dance with him. Mm -hmm. And Jacob was so buried in his chest and focused on what he wanted that he didn't see what the angel was trying to do. It was such a beautiful symbol to me of what God is trying to do in our lives that, that he wants to lead us. Lead. And that's the, that, yes. I, I, so yeah, immediately I'm like, he wants to lead us. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And we want to lead him. Yes. And that, that's the struggle. There you go. Right. Yes. There. Yes. I love that. I can see, I have not seen that painting, but I see that image in my mind. So clearly we're almost like, there's such a patience in it as well, because you're like, actually the Lord knows the dance knows the steps, wants to lead us, will take such good care of us, will teach us in the places that we stumble, will not let us fall, all of those things. And yet we have our head down like, no, we need yeah. to go this way. And it's That's just, right. yeah, it's such a, it's such a tangible illustration of what, of what we do all the time. I have a friend that talks about breaking down our own doors. He's like, I have to watch for when I'm trying to break down my own doors and when I'm letting God open them. And I think that's just another way to say what you're talking about. And I know for me, when I am trying to break down my own doors or lead the dance, I know I experience a lot more anxiety and frustration and fretting. And that's just a signal to me, like, wait a second, are you trying to push something ahead? You know, you're trying to lead the dance. And, um, and so I just try to watch for that in myself because then that's a time to pull back and repent and really say, wait a second, what are yeah. you wanting me to do? Maybe nothing. Right. But I think right. I'm trying to control the narrative here. Oh, definitely. And, you know, God has grace for us controllers. Um, and I am. I, I definitely wanted to include a story of that because I think David obviously went his own way with Bathsheba and all the fallout that happened with Uriah. 
And yet when he repented, you know, God works all of that into your story. So if anyone's made a bad decision, that's listening and thinking, oh, this is why my whole life is ruined because of that. No, God can work that wrong turn into your testimony. It's really just a matter of turning and saying, no, I am going to trust you from here on out. I'm going to trust you. And he'll take you no matter where you are to where you're going. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Lori, this has been so fantastic. Where are you experiencing God's faithfulness right now? What's bringing you peace or joy as you're launching this book and doing this part of your ministry? What's what, where is he speaking to you? Well, I have, uh, you know, I've been a stepmom now for 13 years and our boy who we've raised, he was six when we married and he's now 20 and he's going into the Marine Corps and we're so proud of him. He he actually has been on the worship team at our church and has worked with the junior high kids. So it's been such a joy to watch him grow. But we're going to become empty nesters. And I I am finding great joy from the speaking and the writing that I'm able to do. And right now, I have just been in awe of how God is using the messages in this book. I just feel like people are hungry to know how they can trust Mm -hmm. this invisible God who takes too long, who Mm -hmm. they don't see. So it's been a delight to encourage people with some of these well-known stories that you might not know the parts of that are in this book and just and just give people insight and encouragement. That's been a joy for me. I love that. I love that. Well, you've been an encouragement to us today so much, and I can't thank you enough for just spending a little time with us and teaching us and encouraging us. And Lori can be found at laurieshort.com. And this book, her newest one is called Faith, Doubt, and God's Mysterious Timing, 30 Biblical Insights About the Way God Works. Her podcast is called Faith, Doubt, and God's Mysterious Timing. Any other call to action or place you'd like to send the listener? Uh, no, just, um, just the website. I think they'd find everything. I'm, I'm on Instagram, YouTube. That's where I'm most active. So if they're on social media too. All right. And I will link all of those things, the places you can find and follow Lori in today's show notes. And um, again, one more time, Lori, thank you so much for serving us today. You're so welcome, Angie. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you friend for listening until next time. Peace. Oh, the peace that sings in Lori's voice as she talks about a waiting that has become peaceful and invites us into the same. That doesn't mean it's easy. No, that doesn't mean she doesn't struggle. No, but it does mean she trusts the Lord to lead the dance. Our verse again this week is Lamentations 3.26. Here at this time in the HCSB, it is good to wait quietly for deliverance from the Lord. And if you haven't yet, I encourage you to listen to Monday's Take It In episode where I'm joined once again by the amazing Susie Crosby, and we will talk about the word quietly. Also, if you're interested in learning more about the beta group for Steady On University I mentioned in the mid-roll, please click the link in the show notes and take a minute to learn more or email me at steadyonpodcast at gmail.com. I would love to have your help on this project. Next week, our Take It In verse will be 1 Samuel 36. I absolutely love the book of 1 Samuel, and the verse will remind us that we can strengthen ourselves in the Lord. My guest next week will be Dr. Michelle Bankston, and she'll be talking to us about reaching out to God when our chronic pain, emotional or physical, gets to be too, too much. If you haven't yet, I'd be so grateful if you would subscribe or follow the podcast on whatever directory you're using to listen It only takes a second and it guarantees you'll see new episodes as soon as they drop. And if someone came to mind today as you were listening, I would love it if you would share this episode with them. Inviting them into what we're doing here is another great way to support the show. Thank you so much for listening. I pray wherever your day takes you, that you are walking in the confident knowledge that you are a beloved, cherished child of God. Peace.